Hello and welcome to this episode of the Curiosity Key podcast. I'm joined with Ben Finley. Hello, Ben. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, how are you doing, Charlie? Thanks for having me. Well, this is really special because I know that you have a podcast. You're very familiar with podcasting, but this is your first time actually being interviewed on a podcast. Isn't that right? Yeah, Matt. I've never been on this side of the of the microphone uh, or Zoom. It's all Zoom now, isn't it, man? Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. My podcast. I've been doing it for just over a year. We're on second season two now. Just recording season two. So, um, or I think it's just come out. I, I don't know. Uh, but because um, I don't know, I forgot when this goes out. But yeah, it's definitely it'll have come out by now. So, if you want to check out my podcast, feel free. But um, yeah, it's it's actually quite flattering. Thank you very much for having me on this. I I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Well, it was really great to, I think we were on a Zoom call the other week where we were talking about all things technology. And the reason why I wanted to get you on this podcast was because you've got a lot of exciting things going on and um, that you are trying to save a lot of products that are sitting on shelves collecting dust doing nothing and getting them out sort of being resold and saving people having to remanufacture them uh because i just think that there's so much waste that goes on in the world and it's just wonderful that people are identifying ways to recycle reuse and repurpose things so absolutely man shall like we get started like tell me well tell our listeners you know what what is the business and what are you trying to achieve okay so the business is called machinecompare.com we um, we started uh, about four years ago. It was my brother and I. We had a um, – basically, my background was I, I traded in industrial machinery for about 14, 15 years. Um, my brother was a Durham X MBA, and he was quite high up in the travelsupermarket.com. Um, he then came to join the business, and you know we saw that there was um, – the market was changing, and we saw that there were a few opportunities. So we thought, well, look. Um, what we're doing is probably not going to be in existence in the next five years. Weirdly, with everything that's gone on recently, uh, that's true. Uh, I didn't think it would all end in that way, but it did. Uh, the um, And it was like, look, we, we think that there's opportunity here for a, a comparison website where we can help people market their website in a better way. And we think that that's going to lead into big things in the next few years. We also had about three or four different avenues that we could have gone down uh all of which required investment and so we we thought well let's get started with the type one website so we really struggled to get that off the ground to just get the money together basically um we managed to do that we um the site that we built initially literally was wordpress cheap it did what it should have done we launched it was everything was wrong with it we had to adjust change it was uh and it do you know what it, it, it's stressful but fun in a way um and also i was having we were having to do the other business as well which was effectively financing what we were doing for quite some time uh, because it was it was it was not going to meet its overhead it was never designed to do that although we would have loved it to i think we had the aspiration that it was definitely going to make loads of money in the beginning and then we were like very quickly like it's not but the ideas it leads on to are so one of the um concepts that we had was having sold industrial machinery is i i kind of realized that there was a lot of spare parts that people usually had in their engineering workshops because i would be in and out of engineering workshops all the time and i would sell machines Um, and the machine i sold was a big it was like three stories high 125 meters long and i would sell the used ones and i would effectively clean up europe and sell to emerging markets so it would go and the conversation once it had gone was always the same with the engineering manager which was, you're right, mate, Uh, so the machine's gone. We bought the spare parts as well. What's left over? And they'd be like, oh, there's none left over. I'd be like, all right, so I have another conversation with you. If the machine arrives at my customer's premises, and bear in mind they were spending like over a million quid on this machine. I was like, if the machine arrives at my customer's uh, premises and the critical stock is missing from the spare parts, he will sue me. I will sue your company and you will be personally liable and will probably end up in jail for theft. So what's in the engineering workshop? And they'd be like, you'd better come with me. And they take me to the engineering workshop and it was because, and it wasn't their fault. All engineers are the same. Their job is to keep machines going. Okay. When, because the company care about production, if the machine goes down, 
they can't produce the product and they can't get it out the door and they can't make money. So he's always under pressure trying to keep machines going. And also, generally, um, critical stock is expensive and he knows it. So he's always an argument for him to get preventative maintenance stock in in order to prevent that happening. So he, um, so engineering managers are all the same. They hoard and they hoard for very good reason so that they don't get into those stressful situations, which they've all been in. So it's actually, you want to look for an engineering manager that has that culture. There's nobody at blame there. So they, they'd always lead me into this Aladdin's cave, and there was so much stuff in every single one. Every single one had so much stuff. And I'd get the bits that I needed, and I'd say, look, mate, I just want the critical stuff. The other bits, you can keep them, because honestly, it's not on a list. Nobody really cares about a few bearings or gears or whatever it is, but I want these key components and put them in a box with an apology and say, oh, we found them in the back and we didn't realize they were there because they've been there for so long. We'd be like, All right, no, no problem. So they get half of what they wanted. I, I wouldn't get in trouble and that was it. So we knew this stock was there. So um, I, when we launched, I approached one of the multinationals that I used to work with and um, I said, look, I think you've got a lot of unused spare parts within your group. Uh, and they said, yeah, look, we think you're probably onto something, but we can't be bothered to to look for it because that's quite a job and it's not really that important to us because we don't really know what's there. So they said, if you want the contract, then you have to get everybody to update their system, their SAP system. So I said, all right. So um, went away and my brother and I spent three months phoning 365 sites globally, speaking with every single engineering manager from this uh, particular group and we got them to update their SAP system. Then we finished that and nothing happened. And a couple of months went past and it was like, well, that was a bit of a waste of time. And then I got a call from a random number on my mobile and it said, look, would you, uh, would you come to the head office? Would you fly out to the head office? Um, I'm not allowed to talk about which group this is, by the way, so I've got to keep <laughs> names fine. out of it. Um, so I said, all right, yeah, no worries. And um, flew out to the head office and they said, right, great. Uh, you've done a really good job. Uh, you've... Uh, We've actually found nearly 100 million euros worth of spare parts within our group. We don't have any use for them. Can you put them on your site? And the short answer was no, because um, that's too much. Uh, we understand what the solution is here. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's an e-commerce website. It doesn't fall under the same dropshipping model as, as Amazon would or any e-commerce site, because you have to have a knowledge about how industry works and about heavy, heavy goods. And there's a whole ream of things, which is why it's unique. Um, that you have to overcome. There's there's about 30 obstacles you have to overcome in order to make this model work. Um, and without industry knowledge, you're just not going to be able to do it. And that, that's that's the that's the tall and short of it, really. So I was like, all right, well, this is great. Uh, and I said to them, I tell you what, we could do it, but do you want to invest in the business? And they were like, we don't think that's a good idea. And then we sat down and thought about it. I was like, no, I don't think that is a good idea because then none of your competitors are going to come on. And they were like, yes. Um, so they said, look, you need to seek investment. So we got a bit of help from them and some other people and effectively it was um we would it was such a threat and it was so disruptive to the market and we had this guaranteed order of a colossal amount of parts that we um we then um managed to uh get a meeting with um potential investors so i flew out to that meeting and um it was a really weird situation because um when i went out there uh, I, I think my brother was like, look, I, d I don't think these guys are going to invest because we're two guys working out of our spare bedrooms. Weirdly, I'm back in my spare bedroom now. Uh, <laughs> and now I have a lovely office, which I can't go to. But um, they were like, look, um, they're not going to invest into you guys working out of a spare bedroom with an idea. They're just going to try and pinch it off us. And we've got to try and figure out a better way of doing this or be a bit more secure. I was like, no, 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 this is our shop, man. This is our shop. This is the this is the opportunity to change our lives sort of thing. So I went to this meeting and um, it's like, have you ever seen the film Slumdog Millionaire? Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's like that. I walked into a meeting. I expected to see two people, right? And there were 12 of them sat around the table and they're introducing themselves and they're all doctors and they've all been to Harvard and they've all been to like these huge prestigious Thing. they're all MBAs and I'm there a guy that's basically failed his degree <laughs> got into sales could sell I can sell this my skill it's my superpower I can sell things right and um, and not only that is I have we had such a passion and such a belief about what we were doing 
and maybe it's like a Mancunian thing is that we we always I always knew where I was going to be was new always knew where I was going to get to I didn't have any doubts about that and I I knew okay this is my best shot but if this doesn't work out I'm I'm still going to do it we're still going to do it like this is too good an opportunity and I sat there and um within uh 15 minutes and they put aside I think an hour for this meeting within 15 minutes um the billionaire investor walks in to the room and sits down next to me and I'd never met a billionaire before so I was like oh right okay I was like this is getting quite serious <laughs> Do you know what I mean? and um it turned into a six-hour meeting and um it probably one of the best meetings I've ever had in my life like I was getting grilled by people but it was 15 years of experience and passion and vision got me through that meeting and at the end of the meeting they were like right okay well we want to invest I'm going to uh, stop you there just before go we it. go on um because I, I can imagine that a lot of our listeners are either interested in in that story so how did you get that meeting in the first place because I think that's a challenge for a lot of people is right okay I want investment what do I do like how we do I go to- about it and how do I get those you know how how can you go to a meeting where somebody has scheduled an hour to speak to you about your idea yeah it's a bit of a difficult one because we fall into an industrial sector also I've got 15 years experience of dealing with um uh, multinationals and high net worth individuals so uh it's my black book had investors in okay and and, and I just I'd never had anything. We'd never, my brother and I had never had anything that was investable before. We'd just always given a service to these people. So I can't say that we went down the usual route. Um, I, 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 but I think that if you have an idea and you're trying to get it off the ground, if you don't have any experience, like if you just have an idea, it's, it's just an idea. You have to try and make that work. And also you have to prove a model. I do think, however, if you can find a market opportunity and you can, um, demonstrate that there's definitely value in that market opportunity then it's easier for an investor to invest the the main reason is that you you need to look for two things and you you really need to make a decision on on what sort of investor you wanted i wanted a value investor we my brother and i wanted we wanted a value investor so we wanted somebody that was also going to give us help because we realized that we needed a little bit of help Um, or some people just want money so they go for VC investment. And that's, that's a co- I can't talk about that because I've never done it. But I think with all of it, regardless whether they're value or just a, a capital investor, they don't want to lose their money. And, and that's it. And you also have to go into an investment meeting understanding that when you leave, if you leave with investment, it will no longer be your business. If you don't have a model where you're if it, even if it's just a huge market opportunity, it doesn't matter. You have to give away a huge proportion of your business and you have to leave your ego at the door and you have to, you have to treat your business like your baby and say, well, if I want this to be huge, I understand that it's not going to be mine. And you have to be prepared for that. I mean, that's also why Bezos is, is a minority shareholder in Amazon, you know, because he gets it. Everybody that's got investment gets it. And if you're too protectionist, if you don't want to give it away, investment's not right for you. And you should maybe focus on doing something um, with the business that doesn't require investment. I think that's yeah. that's probably the key. key that's a really good tip. And um, especially around understanding what type of investor that you want. I, I speak to quite a lot of people that are looking at, you know, using LinkedIn to achieve their goals. And it's whether or not you're looking for a customer or an investor or a new member of staff. It's always good to understand what type of person and personality that you're looking for uh, and then go out and find them. It's, it's, do you know what? That's really important as well, because um you have to also uh, most entrepreneurs by their very nature are really optimistic and um they always think the best is going to happen and I, and i'll tell you it doesn't like it doesn't work that way uh, we've had a hell of a journey uh, my brother died just as we were about to get investment i had to put it back by nearly 12 months because uh, i had to just basically have a lot of counseling and get myself back to normal before i could cope with a big project um <clears throat> so there's always something that will it, it's not easy. You can't judge somebody by their success because you don't know what they've been through. And the other thing, you have to pick your investor very, very carefully. 
if you pick somebody that's only interested in money and they don't understand your business, when you hit those tough times, it's, it, it's going to be horrific for you. If you have an investor who's understanding and passionate, as passionate as you are about your business and, and understands that concept, then um, that's really key. You have to have the right investor. And you also have to have the steel to be able to say no. You have to have that. It takes a lot of strength and it's very scary, you know, um, but having the wrong investor or even having the right investor at the wrong time would be a nightmare. That's why also when my brother passed away, my investors wanted to just push forward because they thought that for me and for my family, it was more important that we had financial security. But actually, that wasn't the case because I didn't have financial security. And in fact, it, the, the nine months from my brother dying to when I eventually got, got back and got the investments through, uh, were horrific financially, like I nearly lost my house. But at any one point in those nine months, I could have said, right, I'll take the investment now. But I didn't do it because I also understood that at that point, I was not able to cope with the project. So I realized I had to get myself ready to be able to do it. And I also had to, to, to make that decision of whether I really wanted to do it by myself and without my brother. Because also the idea the initial idea for this business came from my brother, didn't come from me. The, some of the development projects came from me. It was a kind of a collaboration, but he was the guy that came up with the big idea. So you, you have to sit there and think whether, whether that's the right decision and whether it's the right timing for that decision. But pick your investors wisely right, it, it, because it's they'll own you. They'll own your business. And unless you're comfortable with that and you think that they're the right person, then that is a nightmare. That's, That's a nightmare really, really valuable advice. So thank you very much for, for sharing that and sharing that journey, because I'm sure, you know, a lot of people who are kind of going down that journey of either looking for investment or having those conversations with investors will take a lot from that. Um, so what... Um, so at what point did you decide, right, okay, now is the time to kind of get this going again to, to get that investment? Because what, what was the story there? Well, uh, you mean after after I said to them, I need a break? Yes, yes. Because we've spoken about that before. Um, yeah. So. Well, no, I had to, basically, I, I, after my brother died, I we had overheads of like, uh, I think it was like 20, I was having to bring in like 20 grand a month, which is, which I'd always been able to do. Um, but I, I did it for like three months and then I had a breakdown and um, and I just couldn't cope. I was having suicidal thoughts. I was um, and that's not I wanted to kill myself. I was, you know, it's just you're in extreme, uh, an extremely traumatic situation. And also a lot of other stuff came to the surface. At the surface, I'd worked in three war zones. Uh, I got started to get a lot of uh, PTSD come about. And uh, there was a it, it, basically I just was like, I need help. I need help. And I was fortunate that I have a uh, lovely family who's really supportive. And my cousin and his wife are amazing. And she's really involved with Mind, the mental health charity. And she was like, look, Ben, just phone them, get in touch with them. And she does a lot of promotion and stuff for them. She's, she's amazing. And she said, just get in touch with them and just, just see a counsellor because, um, you know, it's, it might help. And I was like, you know, I need it because I wasn't going to take medication. Medication for me wasn't right, but it, it might be for, for other people. Um, I wasn't going to kill myself uh, at any point because I have children, but you get very invasive thoughts. And the problem is, is that when you have that, when you sleep, it intensifies. So you relive things in your dreams. It's horrendous. And um, so I, I went for like six months of therapy and I was going there twice a week to begin with. And then once a week, and um and i started exercising a bit more and and i generally started to try and get myself together and i started to get my confidence back a little bit i started to paint which i'd never really done before <laughs> and i really enjoyed it so i started to to do bits of art and um uh, just creative things really and then i uh i also encouragement from my uh, cousin and his wife who again are lovely and she she has a podcast and she said but look why don't you just do a podcast because you you'd probably be really good at it because you can talk a glass eye to sleep as you always tell everybody <laughs> I was like, okay I said yeah but I think you've got to listen a little bit for a podcast she was like yeah you, you probably need to do that so if you ever if you ever see a video of me in a podcast I'm always fiddling with something because that stops me talking um 
I shouldn't say that because anybody coming on it now is going to be like, oh, all oh, right, okay. It's really interesting. <laughs> it's quite, it's quite a good tip, that actually, because you just, yeah, want something to distract yourself. I can spin a pen so fast in my hands; it's unbelievable. But the, because um, my mind races, right? My mind races. It's always so far ahead of, of what my mouth is saying. So yeah, I and I did this podcast, and I didn't do it for. Um, uh, I didn't do it for any other reason apart from just to do it with a few people that I thought were genuinely interesting, really lovely and had great stories. And I um, I did four episodes and I just put it out and I got it ranked. I got it onto iTunes and Spotify just through just putting it out there and getting it on. And um, yeah, it charted. It became 71st most popular podcast globally on the iTunes chart. And um, and. It was amazing. Suddenly I got a, a load of people following me on social media that weren't before. And uh, there, it was a real buzz. I got a real excitement. I felt really good. And also it was a thing that I'd done myself. So I think it was really important. That I'd done something myself and it was a success. And I, I suddenly got a huge amount of self-belief. Um, but I can't say that, oh, if I'd have just done that, that would have got me through. There was a lot that went on before that to get me to a point where I said, well, I'm going to try something new. And then I got my confidence back and I just, something just clicked, snapped back into it. And I was like, right, I'm, I'm ready now. I'm ready to go. And that's it. Got on with it. Got on with the project. And um, yeah, we got investment in January. We are moving so fast with what we're doing. So the the project now is the spare parts project. So uh, to date, we found, and this number keeps changing. We found about 300 million euros worth of unused spare parts across five industrial sectors. And these are parts that have uh, either sector-specific or cross-sector appeal. So we're talking about... Have I frozen here? Yeah, I've lost you. Okay, we're back. We're back. We're, we're back, good. man. Where did <laughs> I cut off? Um, you talked about sector specific and cross sector specific. So I think this is, you know, the I think the internet is being rinsed good and proper, like personal people's internets at the moment. So I, I, I live in the countryside. I can probably show you my view. I, ha- I don't know if you can see it. If you're on, there's if you're watching of, on there's YouTube, there's a lot of lights. But um, yeah, I think we spoke about that. Down. You. You live not far from yeah, where I grew there you up. Go. <laughs> really? There you go. All the cows in the field. You can see it there. Oh, but, um, love it. Yeah, no, I yeah, I live in uh I live in Cheshire. Um and uh it's uh and doing that has just screwed up my uh my sound settings, so it's fine. But um oh no, I'm on. I'm on. Right, cool. Yeah, no, so yeah, I live in Cheshire in the countryside, it's lovely, uh, but unfortunately if it rains my internet uh falters uh if anybody logs on on their phone my internet screws up and uh it's rural life man but uh oh well i I live in a city and you know virgin went down the other day and working from home is is a slight challenge let's say um but we're we're back now so uh we're, we're good to go so you were talking about the spare parts and you were talking about um it being uh sort of channel specific and cross sector specific as well yeah, so a lot of what we found is uh, it's just parts. So it's bearings, gears, pumps. Uh, then you've got electrical components, which they really can be used in any industry. So they just have, but they're they're all sitting on the shelves, and there's never been a route to market for this stock. So we're just we're literally finding it everywhere. Like I'll speak to a company, it's like, oh yeah, we've got a hundred million euros worth. Of it. It's just it's just bizarre. We seem to have the right product at the right time as well, because part of what's happened is there's been a disruption to the supply chain. So um, during the corona outbreak, manufacturers have been put in a short working week, which means they can't produce parts. And a lot of uh, industries that we serve um, are essential services. So it's packaging or it's food processing or something. And it's stuff stuff that's really recession proof Mm. and weirdly uh, there's no there's not a massive variance even in the recession. Because people still need to eat, do you know what I mean? And the food needs to be packaged at two two points, so it that doesn't really change. Um, but the issue that they've got is that their production is carrying on. Nobody carries more than three months' worth of spare part stock. When that runs out, if the manufacturers can't make it quick enough, the lead time goes out, and and basically they won't be able to run their machines because they'll all get broken down. Mm, so okay. we're going to have a ready supply of parts that will be cheaper and available and also be able to source be sourced locally that's the plan um 
So why wouldn't you buy from us? Because it will be cheaper, quicker to get delivered. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that's it. That's basically it, price and um, convenience. So that's what we're ticking those boxes. Brilliant. And so when are you launching? Because I can't remember, like, this podcast is being recorded a few weeks <laughs> before it's going to be launched. So when are, when are you due to launch? Well, we won't be launching spare parts when this goes out. The spare parts, uh, we, we are trying to get it ready for July. The initial, and that will be a beta launch. So the initial beta launch, we were trying to schedule for September, but because of the demand from the market right now, and also a lot of companies see this as an additional revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So there's companies that have seen a drop in production that are now looking at how can they maximize their asset value and how can they sell assets externally. So we, we've kind of just hit this perfect storm in a way. And I don't want to sound gleeful about that because it's, there's a lot of people that are going to be struggling right now. But for our particular project, this situation has been positive for that project. Um, but we, we're hoping to be at beta in July. I, but, but I don't know until we get there. And then once we get to beta, hard testing, uh, we've scheduled six to eight weeks. I don't know whether that's long enough or not, but definitely we'll be launching this year. The other product that we've launched all that we're doing at the moment is a um, is a, a we we set up a cross sector industrial auction for used machinery. So the idea with that is that basically you, the traditional way of selling machinery is not working. Uh, you can't travel across borders and inspect, and uh, you would usually rely on a dealer who again would do managed demonstrations. That doesn't that's not working. So we set this auction up, um, and we're trying to get as many machines in there as possible and we're trying to do that at two points in the year so we turn it into like a black friday event okay. um, and that's basically to help people uh do plan turnover of machinery so we're not dealing with we're not trying to deal with distressed stock we're not dealing with co company bankruptcies we're just dealing with these machines work we need them out because we need to change over and there'll be somebody going i can't afford a new one but i need a machine that i know that's going to work so it's trying to connect a with b basically and just do it in in that in that sort of way so we're trying that as well that's um that's a new approach because usually auctions are for distressed stock they're just they're stock that's not worth anything but we're not going after that market because there's a lot of people that do that and that's not us so um so yeah so we're trying to do things to help and we launched uh, a webinar uh platform as well we basically we we're quite reactive to the market yeah, we were going to talk about that, which is great because I think yeah. there are a lot of businesses, um, you know, pivoting and adapting and trying to you know, basically cope with a completely different style of working. So how um, how are you how are you adapting and, and reacting, I guess, to, to what's going on at the moment? Well, I think it's um, I think it's really important, even on a more basic and granular level. And this is even before you start your business. You have to have. Uh, you have to have your focus. You have to have your customer in mind. Everything you do, you have to think, how is that going to benefit somebody? Like, who am I trying to do this for? How is that going to benefit them? And are they ready for this idea? There's a lot of people that come up with amazing ideas, but don't understand about the application because they've never thought of the customer. How is the customer going to receive this message? How are we going to monetize it? What are they prepared to pay? What's the benefit to them? Because all they care about is them. Basically, they're just not going to spend money on a on a on a vanity project because most businesses can't afford that. It's a really they're good point that you said about looking at um, are, are they even ready for what you've got to offer? Because I did a training like literally the other day around that because I think a lot of people try to funnel the marketing message to each stage of the market, but you've got some people that have a problem, but they have no idea they have a problem. So yeah. if they've got no idea they've got a problem, you've got to first make them aware that they've got a problem and then tell them about the solution and then why that solution will help them. <laughs> you know, you can't sort of send a message saying how great you are if they don't know what problem they've got in the first place. Yeah. And nobody likes to hear how great you are because that's a, that's a really rubbish conversation to have with people. <laughs> nobody likes that ego. Uh, but no, you have to, uh, with any new idea and all of our, di all of our ideas and all of our applications are disruptive. So we deal with disruptive technology. Technology by its nature is disruptive. It changes the uh, status quo. You have to identify people who we call early adopters. And you might have a room full of 100 people. 1% will be your early adopters. And, and that's great. You have to find them. And you have to profile them. And you have to get them on board and you have to work with them to develop your product. OK, and early adopters are quite easy to spot because early adopters will have everything first. 
They're the guys that bought DVD players first. They're the guys that probably are driving Teslas, even though they, there's not enough charge points. There's those guys. Look for those guys. They won't be dressed traditionally. They're not. That's not your guy. Your guy is the guy that is. He's, he's probably had a product that he's had to find early adopters for himself as well. So they're more receptive to that message and they understand your journey. Um, so that's that's what you have to do. And you have to tailor your product to them and say, right, OK. And, and the great way is to get them on board. And as long as they see the benefits, they're also your biggest champion. They'll tell everybody how great you are and you can use them because in turn, if your product helps promote their product or helps benefit them, they should have no problem in, in doing that. So you want to make friends and that's it. Don't don't force things on people. It's like a, I always use the analogy and I, I don't really want to offend anybody because I, I want to put it out there. I don't eat meat. <laughs> so before I come out with this comment. Um, oh, steady. I'm, I, I'm the, the result of a long line of butchers. So. <laughs> okay. Well, my grandfather was a butcher, but I do it for health reasons because I had hypertension and I cut me out. My blood pressure dropped. So that was that was for me. You don't want to be a radical vegan. OK. And the reason for that is there is a there is a place for that. OK. There is a place for those, those outriders, but they don't get a lot of support. You you need to bring people along for the journey. So you've got to educate them. And it's saying like, oh, don't eat meat. Meat is murder. It's not going to happen. But what you say is, look, if you're eating meat for five meals a week, it, the health benefits for eating meat for eat, just cutting it, just not eating that one extra burger a week or that one extra steak. First of all, financially, it's cheaper. And second of all, you're going to get all these additional health benefits. So there's a monetary gain and a health gain. And, and they start with that. And then they go, oh, actually, I quite like this. And you go, well, why didn't you experiment with a few different recipes? Because try this dal or try this, try this, whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, actually, this is really, really tasty. There's a lot of flavor in this. And then they will themselves progressively cut down and they might end up eating meat once a week. They'll never probably not eat meat. But yeah, you're going to achieve your goal a lot faster because at the end of the day, like, you know, the goal of the radical vegans is to stop people eating meat, which is a very long term goal. You're kind of like trying to fight against we'll centuries worth of conditioning. It's never going to happen overnight. But if it you, yeah, happen. like you said, bring people along with that journey and, and talk about what matters most to them. So, yeah. Like, I, yeah, I eat meat, but I love vegan and vegetarian cooking, but I would just rather it be called plant-based and focus on the fact that it's delicious and it's a complete meal rather than the fact it's meal. not, you know. It's yes, but it's meal. the same in marketing, isn't it? You know, everybody's, yeah. they're trying to get people to come along to your cause. You're thinking too much about yourself when you market rather than thinking about the person that you're actually trying to convert or trying to speak to, trying to have a conversation with. And also people get obsessed with their product. They get obsessed with their product and they lose sight that the fact that somebody actually has to buy this. Yeah. Especially Who's in gonna... technology. Yeah. Well, also, it, and, and that's great. So sometimes you need a partner. Do you know what I mean? You need a partner that understands the application and, and, and that can work quite well. Um, or, and also plan. You have to plan. Like it doesn't cost you anything once you've got an idea to pick up the phone and start to speak to people, like it's amazing it emails out there, social media and all the rest of it. But the phone has never died. The fax machine's been and gone, but the phone has never died. And the reason is, is people like to have a chat. They like to have a conversation and um, you know, and it's just, and it's really open questions. Tell me about the problems you're facing with your business. Uh, we're in this sector, do you know, is it, can you see any applications for what we're doing? And what you'll find is that they might come up with the idea that you've come up with, but they might have a better application for it, in which case you have to listen and you have to say, right, well, I am actually going to change. This. And once they're on board and say, look, if I can solve that problem, would you help me? Because I think I can do it. And you're almost building your first customer because you've got them invested and they also feel ownership of what's what's happening because they've inputted their opinion and you've listened to them and you've said, look, I, I understand that. That's great. Uh, this is what I've been working on. I'm not sure it's quite the right fit, but could we try and adapt it? And would you be prepared to be our guinea pig? Because um, we'll give it to you for free because you have to also do that. Just because it's your idea doesn't mean people are going to pay for it from day one. They're not. You've got to get it right. And you've got to plan. And that's it. Plan. Plan. Uh, what is it? Uh, failure to prepare is is preparing to fail and that is such a that is that is a really like david brent thing to come out with but um but it's true 
It's true, man. <laughs> it, it, it is yeah. very true. But I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that because I know um, a lot of people in, in technology have a resistance to sales. I know I definitely used to have a very big resistance to sales and also picking up the phone with people. So in your experience, I, you know, you've already just given us some great, great tips around starting conversations. Um, how how do you initiate those key conversations especially if you're starting something new okay so first of all sales is the oldest profession in the world people say it's not they say it's something else but before she gave it away she had to sell it right do you know what I mean that's that's basically it it's the oldest profession you sell every day do you know what I mean you 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 you're, you are your product if you've got a girlfriend or boyfriend you've you've sold your personality to somebody already so the 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 illusion that people can't sell is is gone like everybody can sell okay and all selling is is it's identifying problems that people might have and trying to help them so sales is just helping people and if you're not helping people quite honestly you shouldn't be doing it and that's my personal view because i have an ethical approach to what we do like i don't want to put any product out there that doesn't have a benefit if there's no benefit to your product nobody will do it so that selling is really straightforward you shouldn't be afraid of picking up the phone um also don't ever take anything personally you know you you could you can pick up the phone and and the and the bloke's dog might have died that morning and he's and he's he's annoyed and you're the sixth phone call he's had and the ones before you were trying to sell him ppe or something else or you know or you might have had somebody trying to do a credit card scam on him just before he picks up the phone with you and you finally get through to that guy and uh, they literally tell you to do one in a, in an unceremonious way. And that happens quite a lot. I get probably one of those phone calls every day, but maybe it's just me. And the, um, and the other thing is, uh, this is, a, this is probably quite a good tip is that, uh, your mood is contagious. So if you're in a bad mood, don't expect other people to be in a good mood because you it will rub off on them. You have to be in a good mood and you have to be positive and you have to be, a uh, you have to try and be amenable and because you're trying to help somebody if they don't like you they won't buy from you so just be a little bit likable talk to them like they're an old friend you know and be understanding you know hi uh, can you help and also ask people for help people always instinctively like to help that's my first line hi i was wondering if i can i was wondering if you could help me please you yeah know, it's a basic polite. human instinct isn't it you just want to help people especially if they ask you for help advice support guidance you know you you want to everybody's a, a natural helper yeah my line's always um hi i was wondering if you could help me please uh i'm trying to understand a little bit more about your business i've been on your website i'm just trying to understand about what you do and they will go off on a huge monologue about how great their business is. do you enjoy working there is it good yeah it's good okay and they go oh i'm sorry what are you trying to do well actually what i'm trying to do is i have a product and i was just trying to figure out whether it's applicable for you guys because i'm trying to help companies that are in your position boom you're in um who would be the right person i would need to speak to oh well that would be john but you'll never get him. Okay, well, that's fine. I don't want to hassle him. What's the best way to get hold of John? Has he got an email address or is he on LinkedIn? Oh, and you're in, you're in. It's, it's really that simple. And if they're not receptive to your message, put down the phone. Don't, don't put down the phone. But like, they're not receptive to your message. That's okay. Move on to the next one. Don't take it personally. Not everybody's going to buy from you. Not everybody uses Amazon. Not, not everybody does. My old man's 80 years old. Amazon will never be able to sell that app onto his phone. It will not happen. <laughs> and, and that's fine. So understand who you're trying to market to. And you, you will understand when you start to try and speak to people because you'll see who's receptive and who's not. And then you, you segment that, those people and you say, right, this is the profile. I know that my market is, is men or women aged between 24 and, and 55 who are at this level position in the business. And you, as soon as you, the more people you speak to, the better your profiling will be. And you can also hone your message to them. And then you start to look at where are they going to be? What do I need to be doing? They all might be into football or they all might be into swimming or they all might be into something or they're all part of a group, a society or whatever else it might be. OK, well, they're all into that. So how can how can we also complement what they're doing and how can we get their mess maybe we'll support the groups that they're involved in because if we support the groups that they're involved in they're more amenable to our message and it's just and it is it's that funnel okay because what you eventually want to be doing is picking up the phone 
and contacting people who are going to buy. You want to have low time, high return. You don't want to do a spray and pray strategy because it'll cost a lot of money, a lot of time, and you'll have very little results. So you have to start somewhere and just start saying. And also the other thing is I think people get a bit too complicated about the message. So there's always a thing like try and talk to somebody that hasn't got a clue about what you do and break it down really easily. So There's that they a great get it. tip around that that I tell a lot of people, which is if you were trying to convince Homer Simpson to get off the couch, to be interested yeah. in what you've got to do, how would you do it? <laughs> I'd say, Homer, I've got a few donuts over here. Do you fancy a chat? Yeah, you would. <laughs> or like free beer or, you know, come and come and talk to us. There's a beer waiting or there's some donuts here. You know. Barney's upstairs with your wife, Homer. What? <laughs> 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 you know, it's, but think about it in the simplest way possible and also um think about it in terms of a tweet if you had to tweet somebody what it is that you do you've only got 140 characters or rather this is the old school twitter uh, i think they've we've got more characters to play with now um, i'm rubbish yeah, on twitter don't don't do twitter. Me on. Oh, i, I do twitter. no i'm on it but i'm rubbish i'll tell you what it is i uh i'm 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 like i'm i'm the early adopter right so i started off on uh facebook right and i got bored of facebook i thought this is do you know what? There's got to be something new coming out. Instagram came out. I think I was one of the first thousand people on Instagram. Like, no joke. I was, I was straight in there and I was telling, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be the next big thing. And all my mates at the time were going, mate, it's just pictures. What? Nobody's going to be. And uh, No, it's pictures, but it's just likes. So you don't get any of this trolling nonsense on this. This is awesome. They're like, nobody's on it. It'll never take off. Then it took off. And then it, I had huge following on there. And then I was like, I suddenly got this thing, this bee in my bonnet, which was like, do you know what? The generation's coming up now. Their parents are on social media and they're so distracted by it. They're going to reject it all. They're going to reject social media. Right. I'm coming off all social media. And I deleted all of my accounts. Such a stupid thing to do because I lost huge. I could have been an influencer. It was before influencers, right? Oh, De- deleted it all i could have made a bloody fortune right um but i don't know whether i could have done because i was probably quite boring to look at on there but it doesn't matter i had a big following because i was one of the one of the early adopters and then um yeah and then basically uh i then realized no social media is never going away i'll come back onto it so i went back onto it and i kind of i kind of do i like instagram i always like instagram because i feel like i was one of the one of the first people that championed that i'm on facebook but i'm on i just have so many people that are industry people and random people following off. I don't know whether I'm that great on Facebook. Uh, I also, about 18 months ago, got onto TikTok. Oh, no, I, like, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> no, and I was like, TikTok's going to be huge. This is going to be the biggest thing. Because I'm, I'm, I had an Indian customer that was like, oh, I'm on TikTok. I was like, what's TikTok? And I, I looked at it. I was like, this is going to be amazing. This is amazing because... What, what do you do? You want to watch funny videos, right? That's basically what people do now. They've gone progressively past photographs onto funny. This is going to be massive. So I got on TikTok and I was rubbish. So I didn't, I didn't really engage with it, but I was telling everybody for like a year, TikTok's going to be massive. And then now TikTok is huge. I think, uh, you know, I think even my dad, who's nearly 80, is starting to get onto TikTok. But I, I literally don't post anything on TikTok. I just watch, um, I just watch like Ranger and and red bull videos with my kids because they like to see animals and they like to see um they'd like to see all the red bull bmx's doing tricks and stuff oh I'm... yeah that's just amazing i just like, i can't get on with tiktok at the moment i think i'm a bit too <laughs> a bit too old school on that one but yeah no definitely i mean i saw it again like you early on and i was like yeah this is going to be massive because it's like especially how people consume content these days mm. and how people are spending their time everybody's glued to their phone uh, i also think like detox holidays i went on a digital detox earlier this year uh, for two weeks no social media no internet no news nothing and it was amazing yeah. so yeah i think that's gonna gonna be a much bigger thing as we start, yeah. start to move forward I'm pretty disciplined with my social media. You don't, you don't really see anything personal on there. I, I don't put pictures of my kids up there. And I think because we use it for marketing, and I also understand the algorithms that sit behind it. But I would say that also social media is quite important, and it's quite important to understand about who's on which platform and how that benefits your product. So you've got different age demographics. Obviously, LinkedIn is amazing for B2B. It's just the best thing ever. Um, we really built our business off the back of doing really smart LinkedIn 
marketing and we didn't pay for it because at that point you didn't have to you uh, still but, don't but, which is, is great i think you will have to more and more i think we're we're sort of coming i believe we're coming to the tail end of it but you know yeah. it's still a huge opportunity to get great visibility for free also they haven't quite refined the paid for services yet because you can spend an awful lot of money and get nothing out of it so, so i do know that linkedin are launching some quite significant updates to their ads platform in october so yeah. if you are thinking of advertising on linkedin then keep an eye out uh, for that they need to they need to do something because the paid for is absolutely garbage right now in my opinion in my humble opinion for us it's just not been worth it we've got a hell of a lot more results out of just doing it for free uh, but I have an amazing, I now have a team, since best we have a team, I have a marketing girl, Emily, who's absolutely amazing. My team's the best. I, I genuinely believe the people that I've got on my team are unbelievably talented and she is. So she's, she's on the ball with all that. But also you have to understand like B2B, they're on LinkedIn. Uh, a certain age demographic is on Facebook and they'll never leave Facebook. A certain demographic is on Instagram. Um, so they're on, but then you also have to think about how to get your message out there because it's a different strategy with each. And TikTok is an investment for the future because there's a lot of people on there that are 14, 15 years old, but they're not going to stay 14 or 15. You know, in 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 five or 10 years' time, they're going to be really big consumers and they're going to be spending money on stuff and they're going to be in jobs, in companies, and they're, they're the ones. You want to invest in these technologies now, even if there's no benefit to you, if you think your product is still going to be around in 10 years, because that's not the case. Some people just um, have a quick fire product and it's done and they make the money and they, they then move on to the next thing. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine because there's no, there's no hard and fast rule that this is the business model that you should um, that you should follow. You know, you, you have to do what's right for you. It's like we talked about getting investment it's not right for everybody. Some people are good at just being a single uh, business owner. Some people should never run a business. It's not for everybody because that's it. But I also think you should never laugh at anybody that's had a business and failed because most successful people have failed. I, I failed. I've, I've failed twice. Do you know what I mean? And catastrophically, you know, and, but that's okay because you learn from it. The worst is if you have a great idea and you do nothing with it. Mm. So if you're not the person that should be running a business, you can't run a business, but you have a great idea, maybe you should look for a partner, okay, that can help you get your business across. Um, if you're not the sort of person that can manage people, uh, then you shouldn't have a team, you know. And, if, and when you seek investment, investment is all about scaling up. So scaling up is that you have to have a business that will grow and will continue to grow. And they look at a longevity. They say, what is the life cycle of that company? What is the market opportunity? How long will it last? Because nothing lasts forever, okay? And all these huge companies that are around now, at some point, they'll all go bust, okay? So it's what is the life cycle of that business? You have to think about how to scale up and how to do it in, in the proper way so that you can also make profit. And what happens is that when you start to scale up, it becomes more about two focuses always the customer but also your team you have to be really team focused you have to be employee focused how can i make this environment amazing how can i keep this culture of innovation coming through how can i retain staff and it's it's an internal relationship building process that you have as well as an external relationship so it becomes about more about relationships than it does about you being the salesperson and you selling and this is my idea because you're not You've kind of got it off the ground in a way, you know, so you have to think about your personality and you have to also be uh, a little bit brutal about yourself and say, am I that person? Because if you understand about yourself, you'll understand. And, and, and here's the really interesting thing. You don't necessarily make more money if you scale up, you know. You don't. You don't necessarily make the money. Somebody else is going to make the big chunk of money. You'll make incrementally more than you would have done Otherwise, but you have to understand that that's your strategy and that's where you're going to go. Some people make more money just doing it themselves, you know, because they have lower overheads. It's less stressful for them. And it's about a work life balance as well. I think that's why it's really important to understand, you know, why are you doing it in the first place? What do you want to achieve and what sort of life do you want for yourself? Because uh, I've, I've seen a real significant difference, especially with what's going on uh, with the coronavirus at the moment. Um, businesses that put purpose at the heart of everything that they do 
are coming around this with a much more positive attitude. They're doing better. They're seeing opportunities. They're moving forward. Whereas businesses that put profit above everything else are really struggling. They're in panic mode. They're very reactive and sort of making sort of strange strange decisions publicly i've found i think um, it also yeah. comes down to culture as well it yes. comes down to the culture within the business it's like uh, a lot of businesses are like oh i never thought that working from home would be so productive it's like well because you don't trust your employees you hmm. should trust your employees you should have the best team if you don't have the best the team don't do it social media as well i get again get asked the question all the time is like, well, um, how do we monitor so, uh, you know, social media activity from our employees? It's like, well, you need to trust your staff don't, don't because micromanage. your staff are going to be your best salespeople. Your staff are going to be your best advocates. And if, if, you know, you want to advocate for, you want to be their advocate. You want to help them showcase their brilliance because yeah, that's how you're going to elevate your brand. That's how you're going to sell more. That's how you're going to elevate your company. Um and don't micromanage it's the yeah. worst my, for me i always say i've got the best team because my team make me feel like an absolute idiot every day because they're so much smarter than me they're so much better at their individual disciplines i can't tell them anything we set the objective together and they tell me how they're going to achieve that and that's it that is really it my my benefit is that uh my brother and i had a vision okay you have to have a vision and you have to have the passion because I was telling you before we start this, my working day can start at nine o'clock in the morning and finish eight, nine o'clock at night. I deal on the, in a global business. I'm dealing with China, Taiwan, all across Europe, UK. Then I switch across to America at the back end of the day. And I'm speaking with people all the time. So I, I my work-life balance at the moment is a bit rubbish. I do try and balance it out. So I have two days where I'm doing USA days, Okay. I always make sure I have breakfast with my kids. But if I'm having a USA day, and even if I was in the office, I would do the USA days from home because I wouldn't want to be getting home at 10 o'clock at night having done a really long day. So I would always work from home. Um, And that's it. You have to have a work-life balance. But also just trust your employees. Like it's a bad business if you are trying to micromanage and you're trying to – you can't control everything. And and that inherently, if you're the person that's trying to control everything or you're just focused about money, if you're focused about money, you'll never, you'll never really get. I, in my experience, you never really get that. You'll never really get there. You'll never, you'll never be satisfied. We all know people that money is their god. They'll never be satisfied. You have to have a bigger objective than that. Money is, money is in the scheme of things very important because without the money, the business will fail. But you have to have a vision and a passion and be able to monetize that and scale that and and, and get forward. But if your focus is money, then just do a job that's going to get you money. Don't try and build a business because you'll be intolerable to work for and um, and just get your money and, and I hope that that makes you happy. But if you have a true vision and a passion, well, then you'll find a way to make it work. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's great advice. And I think probably great advice to start rounding up this interview because there's lots of good stuff here. And if anybody's listening and starting to think, all right, I wish I'd taken notes or I'm on the move, all of the show notes are available on my website. So you don't need to worry about that. Can I just jump in before we finish and say that this is pre-recorded. As I understand, this is going out uh, in July and I will be doing a thousand mile bike ride over nine days. Uh, to raise money for Mind, the mental health charity. So if you uh, search for me on social media, it will be Ben Findlay. I think some of my handles are I am Ben Findlay, so I have a unique tag. Um, You'll find my Just Giving page. You'll probably find lots of stuff out there that's being pushed. If you search for machinecompare.com, there'll be stuff going out on there. But we're trying to raise money for what was a fantastic charity that helped me. And I think in the current state, there's a lot of people that will be suffering with isolation, depression, uncertainty, the loss of their jobs, um, financial pressures, and organizations like Mind really do a fantastic job. And if you're struggling with any of those mental health issues, uh, for whatever reason, ask for help, pick up the phone, call Mind, call the Samaritans, speak to some friends if you've got them, uh, but don't be afraid to ask for help because I did. It was the best decision I ever made. And, um, you know, I don't want to say look at me now because that's really like a rubbish thing to say. But um, but I was able to then go on and, f- and, and do what I'm doing. And I wouldn't have been able to get there without a lot of help. Um, and it was fantastic. So I'd say, um, uh, but yeah, if you can, if you've got the spare money, sponsor me, 
uh, put a bit in the pot. If you haven't got the spare money, then do do me a favor. Do a bike ride, whether it's 5K or 1K or whatever it is. Just get on your bike. Uh, it's in the name of my brother, Oakfin. Just get on your bike and do a little bit of exercise because it will make you feel better and, and make you feel part of the team. And I'd, I'd appreciate the encouragement, whether it's monetary or whether it's just physically you telling me you've got me to get on my bike today. That'll really help because a thousand miles is is going to be tough. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I wish I've done many hundred mile bike rides over the years and I've never done a thousand miles. That sounds like quite a quite an insight. I just hope you've got good padding in well, your uh, in your trousers. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm shaped like an egg with legs, so I'm not the fittest <laughs> of guys, but I'm hoping that the um my aerodynamic body shape will give me some sort of advantage. <laughs> uh, all I can say is just invest in good quality cycling pants, like literally. Um I yeah. I spend a lot of money on cycling pants. They definitely make yeah, a huge difference. Man. And this podcast has now taken a turn. But the best <laughs> thing about interviewing somebody that has their own podcast is that they answer all of your questions before you've even asked them. So my next question would have been... <laughs> would have been... Okay, yeah, I just wanted to get it in because I thought you were wrapping up, man. No, I was like, don't be deaf. No, because Go also ahead. the links um, to Ben's challenge will also all be in the show notes. So any Amazing. support, because my, Mind is an incredible charity. There's lots of good stuff going on and... You you know, if you can support in any way, um, not just now, but any time in the year as well. Just, you know, keep an eye with what they're doing and uh, also keep an eye on your own mental health and mental well-being. I did actually do, um, there's another interview uh, with an incredibly inspirational woman called Jana Dowling. So if you are interested in mental health, mental well-being, mental fitness, then definitely check out Jana's episode as well, because there's lots of good stuff and tips and things like that in there. Cool. Awesome, man. I'll definitely do that. So, Charlie, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really thank appreciate you. it. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Just before we go, any parting words of wisdom that you could sum up in one quick sentence? Jesus, parting words. I, I'm not that wise. I'm not that wise. I uh, Okay, so uh, my approach with everything is I approach everything from being knowingly incompetent. And that's my starting point. I would advise anybody trying to do an idea to... Uh, approach it from a position of being knowingly incompetent and then try and seek competent people or try and become competent in the discipline that you're trying to apply that's it there you go always be curious (laughs) there you go parting words of wisdom that are in line with everything i stand for (laughs) you know yeah always be curious because amazing things happen the more curious you are so thank you ven it's been an absolute pleasure and yeah i wish everybody a wonderful day speak to you next time